Let's look at some grounding equipment. Now, I have here an excellent grounding jumper. Would you agree? I sincerely hope that you wouldn't. What are the obvious problems here? Attached to each end of this piece of cable, we have a hotline clamp. A hotline clamp and a ground clamp are two different devices designed to do two different jobs. A hotline clamp is designed to carry a fairly low value current continuously. It's not designed, nor rated, nor tested for a fall current capacity. There's a limited amount of metal there and a limited amount of surface contact. This device will not stand a high value fall current. Note how it's connected to the cable. The insulation has simply been stripped off of the conductor and put in the eye bolt. What are the obvious problems there? There's a potential for corrosion buildup. How are they handled out on a crew? We all know the realities of life on a line crew. They're bent, they're twisted, they're subjected to rough treatment. This produces strand damage, strand breakage. What you've got there may be an excellent device to beat your dog with, but it's a poor tool to ground a line. A ground clamp differs from a hotline clamp in this respect. A ground clamp is designed to carry extremely high fault current values for short time durations. Now we have quite a variety of ground clamps in our AB Chance catalog, and this is one of the smaller C-type ground clamps. And yet this clamp has been rated and tested repeatedly. It has a value of 30,000 amps for 15 cycles, 25,000 amps for 30 cycles. It has more than sufficient surface area contact with the conductor to ensure that during a fault current value of that size, this device is going to stay on the line. Now consider grounding cable. Essentially, there are two considerations in selecting cable. Number one is fall current capacity. Your cable has to stand the fall current. What we're looking at here, by the way, is a number two clear jacketed copper cable. It has a fall current capacity of 12,000 amps for 15 cycles. The other consideration in selecting ground cable is the interfacing or the interconnection between the cable and the clamp itself. It needs to be the lowest possible resistance connection. In this case, we have the best of all possible connections, a compressed ferrule compressed onto the cable, threaded and lock nutted into the clamp. What we have achieved there is the lowest possible resistance from one end of that jumper to the other. Now let's consider some application techniques. There are two very serious considerations in applying temporary grounding, and both are frequently overlooked. The first one is cleaning the connections. This is a connection that you may have to rely on to save your life. It's critical that you clean that cable before you apply the ground set. There is also an option available. The ground clamps can be supplied with a serrated jaw insert. Now you can feel those serrations. They're not sharp. They won't damage the conductor. But they will bite through any corrosion and contamination that may have built up on the conductor and ensure that you get a clean, secure, low resistance contact. The other consideration is minimizing the cable slack. If a grounding set is subjected to a fall current, tremendous electromagnetic forces come into play and will cause a serious whipping action, a violent mechanical reaction in that ground set. Those cables can jump a considerable distance in just a fraction of a second, and they represent a serious hazard, a serious threat to anyone close enough to be contacted by those cables. Now let's summarize. In selecting ground clamps, we have two considerations, fault current and mechanical fit. Will the clamp stand up under the fault current? And will it give you a secure, low resistance connection to the conductor? Ground cable, again, we have two considerations, fault current capacity and the interfacing or the interconnection between the cable and the clamp. The cable has to be equal to the available fall current, and it's critical to have a low resistance connection between the cable and the clamp. Install your grounding assembly in such a fashion as to ensure that the men working on that structure are working in a zone of equalized potential 
wherein everything that they can reach and touch and every part of their body is effectively at the same electrical potential. Now, is there anything we've overlooked up to this point? What's the last thing you do before you apply temporary grounding? Pull your hard hat down a little tighter, maybe put your safety glasses on, say a little prayer. Invariably, at this point, someone will say, you fuzz the line. Fuzzing the line consists of a lineman holding the metallic end of a hot stick up near the conductor and listening for that snapping, crackling, that static noise that indicates the presence of potential. Don't do that. That's a lineman's form of Russian roulette. The point that I'm making here is simply to check for potential before you apply temporary grounding. But check for potential using some kind of an approved instrument, either a voltage indicator or a voltage detector. But use some kind of an approved instrument and check for potential before applying temporary grounding. And in conclusion, remember to always treat an ungrounded conductor with the same respect that you would treat an energized conductor until that conductor is securely and properly grounded. And remember, if it isn't grounded, it isn't dead. Now let's look at some tests of grounding equipment that were conducted at the A.B. Chance Research Center in Centralia, Missouri. In each of these tests, we use essentially the same equipment, a 40,000 amp duct-bill ground clamp and four-odd copper cable. In the first test, using 15-inch phase spacing, we use a configuration consisting of three long leads coming from the duct-bill clamp down to a common ground connection. Bear in mind that this is slow motion photography. That initial cable movement probably occurred in a fraction of a second. Continuing with 15 inch spacing, but changing the configuration now to a phase to phase jumpering with one lead down to the ground connection, we'll pulse this configuration with 11,000 amps. There you see a very dramatic difference in cable motion, emphasizing the need to minimize the cable slack. In this test, we continue with 15-inch phase spacing. We go back to our original configuration of three long leads coming down to a ground connection, pulsing at 18,000 amps. You can see that that would represent a serious hazard to a lineman working near that ground set. We go back now to our phase-to-phase -phase jumpering method, using one lead down to a common ground. Continuing at 15-inch spacing, we pulse now with 20,000 amps. Continuing the phase-to-phase -phase jumpering method and 15-inch spacing, we're up now to 40,000 amps. You'll like this test. What we succeeded in doing here was generating a phase-to-phase -phase fault. We took a little break in the filming here and our cameraman went and changed his underwear. To save wear and tear on his nervous system, we went to 36-inch phase spacing, pulsing at 20,000 amps, using a configuration of three long leads down to a common ground. Note the tremendous cable movement. Continuing at 20,000 amps and at 36 inch spacing, we change our configuration to phase to phase jumpering. However, notice the long drooping leads and note how high they jump when they're pulsed with a fall current. That would be a serious hazard to any man working near that. Continuing at 20,000 amps, using the same phase to phase jumpering configuration, we shorten the leads. Even though we get essentially the same amount of motion, by shortening the leads, it would be more difficult for those leads to make contact with a man working near that area. Moving up now to 30,000 amps and continuing at 36 inch spacing, using the, the configuration of three down leads to a common connection.
Continuing at 30,000 amps, changing to the phase-to-phase -phase jumpering configuration. Note how high those cables jump. Continuing at 30,000 amps, continuing with the phase-to-phase -phase jumpering method, but shortening the cables. Moving up to 40,000 amps, and continuing at 36 inch spacing using the configuration of three long down leads. Note the clamp on the far left. That clamp was deliberately left untightened to illustrate what can happen when ground sets are improperly applied. Continuing at 40,000 amps and 36 inch spacing using the phase to phase jumpering method. Continuing again at 40,000 amps, 36 inch spacing, phase to phase jumpering with the cable shortened. You will now see a series of tests using the eight foot T-handle temporary driven ground rod. In these tests, you will note an incredibly long duration time. At the conclusion of the film, I'll explain that. In the first test, we put the rod in the ground one foot. We had a rod to station resistance of five ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 2,650 amps for a duration time of 53 cycles. In the second test, we again put the rod in the ground one foot with a rod to station resistance of 26.5 ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 4,630 amps for a duration time of 123 cycles. Bear in mind that these tests were done in central Missouri in the dead of winter. In the third test, we put the rod in the ground six feet with a rod to station resistance of 17 ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 3,450 amps, again, for 123 cycles. There's ignition, and we have liftoff. In the final test, we used two rods in parallel. We put the rods in the ground six feet with a total rod to station resistance of nine ohms, pulsing with a fault current of 4,320 amps for a duration time of 61 cycles. We normally conduct these tests just before we go fishing. It gets all the worms out of the ground. Now let me explain something about those long duration times that you saw in the ground rod test. By using a long duration time coupled with a low fall current, we were able to simulate what would actually occur with a much higher fall current and a much shorter duration time. The AB Chance Company earnestly recommends whenever using a temporary driven ground rod, place it as far as possible from the work area and barricade it. Protect both yourself and your public. In anticipation of some of your questions, let me make one or two points. Equipotential grounding is as important for bucket truck work as it is for working from the structure, because the key word there is work. A man working from an aerial device such as a bucket truck in the course of work will frequently be in contact with different surfaces. He may have his shoulder against the cross arm while his hand is on the conductor. He may have his back against the pole while his hands or part of his upper arm is in contact with the conductor. He is frequently in contact with different surfaces. And if those surfaces are of unequal potential, that man is at risk. One of the most frequently asked questions about equipotential grounding 
regards the presence of a pole ground on the pole. And the question is, wouldn't the presence of a pole ground on the pole effectively create the zone of equalized potential? And the best response that I can give to that is that the pole ground is unreliable. It simply cannot be depended upon to do anything. There are too many variables there. The size of the pole ground. How well is it stable to the pole? The resistivity of the pole. How good is the connection between the pole ground and the neutral? All of these are unanswered questions. And they would be unanswered at every work site. The best possible thing to do with a pole ground in your grounding program is just simply to ignore it and not rely on it to do anything for you. Ultimately, it comes down to this. If there is a difference in potential between two surfaces, and you're bridging those two surfaces with your body, if one of those two surfaces becomes hot, a voltage will be impressed across you. And where there is a voltage drop, there will be an accompanying current flow. And if you remember the chart that you saw earlier in this presentation, it requires an incredibly small amount of current for a very short time to produce catastrophic results. The only way that you can adequately protect yourself with temporary grounding is by incorporating into your grounding program the concept of equalized potential. I hope that this presentation has helped you to understand the concept of and appreciate the need for equipotential grounding. For more technical information and equipment details, refer to the Chance Encyclopedia of Grounding.